with everyone talking about purity and how to stay pure, we often think of the words of love, respect, purity, true love waits. But oftentimes, we need to be thinking about the words that contradict love hate high self-esteem low self-esteem because oftentimes when we're trying to teach our children that true love waits and that purity is the way to be and that's refraining from sexual activity and we're trying to teach them all the reasons why as young adults and teenagers that they should save themselves for marriage there is one word that comes to my mind when I was teaching my children, my girls, to save themselves for the man God has prepared for them. And the one word that came to my mind was pure pressure. And so today I want to talk about sex, teenagers, young adults, and purity. Hey y'all, welcome back to Simple Living with Michelle Davenport. This has been on my mind. I really just wanted to share about um, staying pure and about purity. It's just been in my heart for quite some time now and I've just been trying to pray about it and see how God wanted me to bring this about on my channel. And I just want to be honest and talk about the journey that me and my husband took like 30 years ago with our children and just share with you what we did. I'm not saying and suggesting you do what we did. You pray about it and ask God how he wants to lead you in teaching your children how to stay pure and be pure for their, um, for their spouses. But I'm just gonna share our journey and our story. So first of all, foremost, uh, far more important than anything else we've ever done in our lives is we gave our, our life to Christ. Um, two years into our marriage, we said we are not going to make it without God. And so we fell off the altar, gave our life to Christ, and he's been there ever since. And the second thing we did after we had children, as far as uh, purity goes, we bought this book, The Princess and the Kiss, an amazing book by Jeannie Bishop. And, you know, just to, for sake of time, I'm just going to run over the story real quick. It'll give you a synopsis. Um, when the prince and the princess had their first child, the first little girl, they received a dome from God, and in that dome was a kiss. And God said, this is a gift to your child, and she's to give it to her husband on her wedding day. And so keep it safe and, and, and cherish it. And so they raised their little girl up like that, started telling her about it and explaining, and as the years went on, she was old enough to be married. So men started to come to knock, knock, knock at her door. <laughs> and one came and said, I am highly smart and uh, I can uh, take care of you. I'm just a brilliant man. And she says, no, you're not for me. The next one said, I am strong and I will take care of you and no one will ever hurt you or harm you because I will, I'm strong and I'll just surround you with my strength. And she's like, no, not, you're not for me. And the, uh, the third one came along and said, I am rich. You will never want for nothing. I will take care of you all the days of my life. And she says, you know, you're just not the one for me. And then one day a little farmer came to the door, a little farmer guy. And he says, you know what? I am nor, I'm not smart, strong or rich, but I do have a gift I have to offer you. And then he lifted up his little dome with his glowing kiss inside. And he said, I've been saving this for my future bride. Will you marry me? <laughs> and she said, yes. I don't know why I start to get teary-eyed. It is a story in a storybook. But 
I guess what's making me emotional about it is that we read this book to our children. We made it a big ceremony at our house. We made a big deal out of it. We lit candles. My husband read this book and then he prayed over each of our girls. And then when he was done, they each received one kiss from their earthly father, from their heavenly father. I snapped a photo, put it in a five by seven for them to put it on their dressers to be a constant <laughs> reminder that they saved their kiss. And so we wanted to take it a step further than just saving your virginity. We wanted them to go one more step further and, and try it with all their heart to save their kiss. Now, I can almost see the eye rolls. <laughs> if you're watching this with your kids, or even by yourself that you're thinking, oh my Lord, I'm just trying to keep my kids from having sex <laughs> before they get married. And I get that, I totally get that. And I know we live in a different time than even 30 years ago, but these are just the things that we felt compelled to do with our girls and it worked um, to an extent. <laughs> I just need to be honest with you. It was the kiss I really wanted. Our goal was for them to make it until they got married. Um, and gave their kiss away at the altar. Um, but one, uh, my oldest daughter, she, she, the only boy she ever kissed was her husband. And then my youngest daughter, well, she kissed a few. <laughs> she kissed a few guys. And uh, they both walked down the aisle and was pure for their wedding night. And so we couldn't say we're more prouder than our girls. We are so very proud of our girls. And uh, they, they did save their virginity. And I'll tell you what, what saving your kiss did for them. This is what I believe. It set up a perimeter around a perimeter. And so the focus was set in, staying pure and not having sex. But we wanted to set a perimeter around that. So we went a step further and said, hey, why don't you try saving your kiss? <laughs> and I'm sure deep down inside, as my kids got older, girls got older, they probably were giggling and rolling their eyes a little bit too. Because, uh, you know, it just wasn't a popular thing to do. Uh, 30 years ago and it, started, it wouldn't be a popular thing to do today but you know bless their heart they really did try and but they did walk down the aisle and were pure and when I went to seminary I had to study the Hebrew culture and the ways of the Hebrew people and just things that they did traditions and one of their traditions were they had traditions not to break 614 laws in the Old Testament but because they were so scared that they would break those 614 laws they made up other laws as a perimeter around those laws. So even if they broke the smallest law, uh, laws, they wouldn't have broke the 614. That's kind of our mindset when we were uh, doing this is that we were putting a perimeter around a perimeter of virginity. So um, that was our method. They also went to True Love Weights classes for youth and wore rings. <laughs> and then my youngest daughter went to Church of the Harvest and their youth group gave out little gift boxes with, you know, I, with I'm giving you my purity notes inside to give to their husband when they got married. So um, it's all relevant. And so this may not be something that you would do is go out and buy this book and read it and do a ceremony, but I just wanted to share our journey. And I also want to encourage, I felt like this was strongly put on my heart the other day as I've been praying about doing this video, is the girls that have been raped or you know molested, and I've been both, and my, my innocence was definitely stolen from me as when I was 11, but I'm gonna tell you this, that I'm, I'm speaking from my heart. If that's happened, I didn't have anybody telling me this when I was going through this, but I'm here to tell you, if that is you, you can still make a decision to hang on to your gift. And the next time you give that gift away, you will be the one in charge of giving it. And it will not be stolen. You will be in charge of giving that gift away. And so I don't want you to be discouraged and think, well, I've done, you know, every, everything's been stolen from me, so I might as well just go off and do whatever. That's not true. That, that is totally different than it being stolen from you and you choosing to save it. And then there's the other side of the fence where you just wasn't raised like that, or maybe you was raised like that, but you just fell into temptation time and time again. Um, and you just gave it away. Well, I'll be discussing three re reasons why or what guys use to get girls to give, you know, to have sex with them. And I'm sure there's a plethora of them, but three main ones I wanted to touch on today. But I also wanted to encourage you girls or boys 
that are watching this video that even if you've had sex one time or 50 times or 10 times, you can make a decision today. Today's the day. You can write it down. You can make a special day. Make it important. Light a candle. You know, mark it down in your journal. Uh, tell your parents. You know, and and if and and make it monumental. That today's the day that I'm deciding that I am gonna, you know, restrain from, refrain from having sex until I'm married. And because this is what I know that when you do get married, the topic will come up either before you get married or after you're married. How many people have you been with? And I don't want to cast shame on nobody. There is numbers. I mean, I have numbers. There's things that I've done. I mean, that, that I had to say, and I'm going to tell you what, I would rather you not have to say a whole lot. So that's why I'm making this video. I would rather you be able to not, but even if you have, there is just no shaming here. Even if you've slept with like 10 people, today it could be a new day for you that you say, you know what, today I'm not. I'm making a decision that anybody else gets this gift, it's gonna be my husband because I am not giving this gift away anymore from this day forward. Mark it down in your journal, you know, light candles, take a picture, whatever you need to do to make it special. That you made a decision in 2020 to change the trajectory of your life. Whether you're a guy or a girl watching this video, it is never too late to make a decision to abstain from having sex until you're married. Because I know that I know that it would be worth it. Um, I don't know by experience, <laughs> but um, my girls, I just, I know how much their husband appreciated the fact that they came to the altar virgins. And I know how much my girls appreciated being able to give that gift to their husbands. And so we don't want to underestimate the power of that gift. All right, I'm fixing to go through the three things, the three things guys will tell you to try to manipulate you into having sex with them. The first reason that some guys will give you is that if you love me, you'll have sex with me. If you really love me, like you say you love me, then you will have sex with me. And they will say this to you time and time again. It's just like a dripping faucet just trying to wear you out telling you all the time, will you tell me you love me? Well, this is one way you could show me you love me. If, you, if you'll have sex with me, that really means that you do love me. So we should have sex because you keep telling me you love me. So prove it. That is the first thing that you can have big old red flag if your boyfriend's saying this to you. Then if they're saying this to you, you need to take a pause and step back and reevaluate your relationship. The second thing a boy will tell you is we've been dating a long time. We've been dating for like six months now. And so I think we, it's time for us to take our relationship to another level. Don't you? And then you'll say, what's the other level? Then they'll say, well, I think we should have sex because we've been dating. I mean, we've been dating quite some time and we're pretty serious and you have told me you love me. So you said you love me. We've been dating a long time. So I think you should have sex with me. And then girls start thinking about it and start thinking, well, we have been dating a while. And if I don't have sex with him, someone will have sex with him. And so they end up having sex because they feel peer pressure, because they feel the, the, um, that the guy was like, well, if she doesn't have sex with me, somebody else will. And so they start feeling the pressure of that. And you'd think that being said once, well, that wouldn't make much of a difference. But... Have a guy that you care about continually say that to you. And it gets in your head where you're thinking, well, we have been dating a long time. You must really care about me. So, you know, maybe it wouldn't be so bad if I had sex with him. So that's the second thing a guy will tell you to have you have sex with him. Two. Okay, the third reason that a boy will give you for ha to have sex with him is this. It will bring us closer. If we have sex, we will feel closer. We will become as one. 
um, we will have um, that bonding that you can't have or you can't get without sex. Okay, this is a lie. Any boy that is telling you, it will bring you clo- it will bring us closer. We'll have this bonding that nobody else will have. Listen, if a guy really loves you, then he'll wait for you. It's, I, could, I could draw this whole video out for an hour, but the bottom line, if a guy really loves you, he will wait for you. And he will not try to manipulate you into doing something that you wouldn't normally do without feeling like you're peer pressured into it by saying things like, you know, if you really love me, you know, our first reason, if you really love me, you would have sex with me. That's not true. You can really love someone and not want to have sex with them because you're trying to save yourself for your husband. And if they ain't it, then the, then, then they ain't it. And if they break up with you because you didn't have sex with them, then they break up with you because the person that deserves that gift from you will love you enough to wait for you. And I just don't want you to be misled out there, all you young girls and boys misled out there because I think there's girls that do that too. Pressure guys into, I don't think it's one-sided. And so those are my three reasons. Those are my three things that I believe um, the opposite sex, I won't just say guys, but the opposite sex will come to you with to try to manipulate you into having sex before you're ready to. Um, which, you know, should your goal, I believe, should be your wedding night. Um, you know, not everybody is going to like this video. I know that. And I'm okay with it. But I feel, feel like I need to put something out there that um, at least give you some ideas that we did so for your family. So maybe you want to use them. And maybe you don't want to use the, the book, but you want to do the True Love Waits ring. Or you want to, you know, wrap a little gift and do a little ceremony at your own home and give each one of your children a little gift with um, I'm giving you my purity this night with a little note written in there and wrap it up and then give it to your children to say hey when you get married you can give this to your spouse and they can open it up on your wedding night whatever you know I'm just throwing some ideas out there because I think you know it needs to be talked about and I have been heavy on my heart to discuss this topic and I just wanted to share I did want to end with a story um, of, you know, of course my kids, uh, did the true love weights and the gift. And then we also did the, uh, the princess and the kiss. Um, but my goddaughter, I just want to share a quick story about my goddaughter. She had, you know, when they were all younger, they would talk about, you know, what they wanted in a, in a husband, you know, cause we all had girls. And so, that she would talk about, you know, the attributes that she wanted a husband, you know, tall, dark, handsome, smart, tender, loving, kind, Christian, you know, and curly hair. And as she got older, you know, and she started really, you know, thinking about her spouse and just kind of getting a little anxious about it and really just wanted God to give her her spouse. And so anyway, he did. And on their um, rehearsal dinner, this is such a cool story, on the rehearsal dinner, um, they were showing pictures on each side of the screen, one of the bride-to-be, you know, her childhood as she was growing up, and then one on the other side was the groom-to-be and his childhood. And it was just kind of odd. And somebody had told me that one night, Joseph, her husband, um, went to bed and he had, he had straight hair. But the next day, you know, same age and everything, he woke up and he had curly hair. And I, I really dig that story because I remembered that was one of the attributes that she told God, the desires of her heart that she wanted in a husband. And so on her wedding day, I pulled her aside and I said, you know, you, do you remember you getting kind of anxious and a little upset because you really were wanting to get married and uh, you just felt like it was never going to happen? <laughs> And she said, yes. And I said, well, you know, those pictures of your husband, do you remember wanting a man that's tall, dark and handsome, but with curly hair? And she said, yeah. And I said, did you realize in one of those photos, he had straight hair one day and he went to bed and he woke up with curly hair? And she said, yes. And I said, see, you know, in your waiting, God was working. While you were waiting for your spouse, God was working because he was working out every desire, every 
detail. I mean, I get teary eyed talking about it because that's how good our God is. He was working out every single detail for her, down to the curly hair, because his mother said she couldn't explain it. He had straight hair all his life, and then boom, he went to bed, woke up, and he had curly hair. And I know that God had his thumbprint on that because he loved her enough to give her each desire of her heart for her spouse. And she did walk down that aisle and she did the same ceremony that our children did and she did save her kiss for the, her wedding day. And now they're happily married with a whole gang of children <laughs> and uh, just blessed beyond measure. And I just wanted to encourage you today, leave you with this, that you know God's working while you're waiting. And uh, I wanted to encourage you to write down the attributes and the desires of your heart in your spouse and what you're looking for in your mate. Because God so cares that he took a straight hair boy and turned him into a curly haired man. <laughs> All right, well, thank y'all for stopping by Simple Living. God bless you and thank you for letting me share my heart today. Bye-bye.